This is the other Bundesliga, and you're listening to the first part of a special historical episode of your number one Austrian football podcast. Welcome to the Other Bundesliga podcast. Thanks for joining us. My name's Tom Midler, and I'm joined today in the studio by our resident football historian, Lee Wingate. We've got a very special start to a two-part series for you today, because the Other Bundesliga, and Lee in particular, has been looking in depth into the life and death of one of Austria's most famous footballers. That man is Matthias Schindler. And Lee has a very, very in-depth report for us over the next two episodes of the Other Bundesliga. We're going to look into the history and the story of this Austrian football icon. Lee, how did you hear about the story of Matthias Schindler and, and what got you interested to do this this report on him? Well, I've always really been interested in, in football history. Combining two passions of mine, football and history, has always been something I've really enjoyed. And as such, when I was, when I was younger, I got given a, a DVD box set, which was called The History of Football. It was really long. It had like seven volumes or something. And, and on one of them, uh, which was about basically football in the interwar period, I saw footage of Schindler in black and white, this sort of grainy footage of him juggling a football and smiling at the same time. And I remember the narrator saying that he was one of the the key players in the Austrian Wunder team and that he died in a very mysterious way. And so I guess, yeah, I was pretty intrigued by that and wanted to take a closer look. And so for those who don't know anything about Matthias Schindler, why is his life and death as well worth exploring? Well, his life is worth exploring just because... Really, Austria hasn't produced all that many world superstars when it comes to football. Obviously, in the modern day, you've got Alaba and there have been a few over the years, but but Schindler really was, in his era, one of the very best. A Messi of the 1930s. I know that's such a a difficult comparison to make, but a a really great player. And so for that alone, it's probably worth it. Because of the way he died as well, it's basically never been concluded how he died, but the common consensus in Austria is over the years has basically been that he was killed in suspicious and unexplained circumstances by the Nazis for his refusal to to play for the Greater Germany team once once Austria was annexed. So I really wanted to to have a look into his life and death, sort of draw some conclusions myself. And so we even spoke to a man called Camillo Franca, who is Schindler's biographer. He spent eight years researching his life and death, so we're going to be featuring him on the episode as well to try and work out what really happened. So without further ado, let's get involved in it. We've broken it up into chapters and we'll break these chapters down into a couple of episodes in this series as well so that we can explore everything really in depth and uh, tell you the interesting story of a man named Matthias Schindler. Chapter 1. Humble Beginnings Our story begins in Kozlov, a small Czech village about 120 kilometres southeast of Prague, where the local population has more or less hovered around the 500 mark since the 1890s. Then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, it was in this sleepy municipality that a young couple, Johann and Marie Schindler, decided to start a family in the early 1900s. Their firstborn, Matthias, the protagonist of the story was born on the 10th of February 1903, followed by a second child, Rosa, just under two years later. But Kozlov didn't have much in the way of future prospects to offer the young family, and so Johann and Marie made the difficult decision to relocate to Vienna, where they settled in the bustling district of Favoriten. They were by no means the only ones to do so, though. Austria witnessed a wave of immigration from Czechoslovakia during this period, and by the time the Schindelars had arrived in Favoriten in 1905, a remarkable 25% of the inhabitants spoke Czech. Being able to speak their native tongue ensured the family did not feel too isolated in those early years. The Schindelars moved into a small flat in Quellengasse, and Johann, like so many of his fellow immigrants at the time, found work in a brickyard. It was a gruelling and demanding job, with workers often required to be present 15 hours a day for seven days a week. It wasn't overly rewarding either. Brick workers were among the worst paid people in Vienna. 
The young Matthias started school in September 1909, and it was during this time at the Schwabenschule that he was introduced to football by a teacher called Karl Weimann, who had once played for Sportclub Rudolfshugel, one of the most prominent teams in Favoriten. The young Schindler instantly fell in love with the game and would while away his evenings kicking a ball about in the street with friends. By the time Matthias entered his early teenage years, World War I had broken out and his father had been sent to the front to fight for the Austro-Hungarian army. Johann was away for several years before the family received the tragic news that he had fallen on the Isonzo front, on the border between Italy and Slovenia, on the 21st of August 1917. It had a huge impact on the young Schindler, who would later go on to say, The most painful experience of my boyhood was the day that we received the news that my father had fallen on the front. Some difficult weeks and months followed and it wasn't easy for my mother to care for me. With the family breadwinner gone, Marie was forced to find work to support herself and her children, of which there were now four. Matthias and Rosa had been followed by two girls, Leopoldine and Teresa, who were born in 1906 and 1913 respectively. Marie solved the problem by setting up a laundry in their home. The tragic loss created a special bond between her and her only son, and she was over the moon for him when, a few months later, Matthias was spotted by a Hertha Vienna official and invited to join the schoolboy team. Knowing that times were tough, she was simply glad that he would get some sturdy shoes and a hearty meal at training once a day. It was there that Schindler's footballing adventure began. It would be the first step on his journey to greatness. Chapter 2. The Breakthrough if you ask any modern-day Austrian football fan whether they've heard of Hertha Vienna, the answer will most likely be no. That should be no surprise, given that the club folded shortly after the outbreak of World War II due to prolonged financial difficulties. But the picture was rosier when Schindler joined in 1918. At that time, Hertha Vienna were a regular fixture in the top flight, despite having finished in the drop zone the previous three seasons. In fact, they only stayed in the division because relegation was suspended during World War I. Club officials knew a change in strategy was required if they were to keep their place at the top table once peacetime returned. They subsequently placed an emphasis upon youth development, scouting local lads like Schindler and inviting them to train with the schoolboy teams. Schindler made an immediate impression at youth level, where he played as a centre forward and wowed onlookers with his sophisticated technique. Having watched him play regularly, one of the club's former defenders, Ludwig Jetzinger, even went as far as to say... After I'd seen Schindler play for our schoolboy teams for some time, I predicted that he would go on to become one of the greatest players in Austria. Hertha's performances and results quickly stabilised in the post-war period, and the club achieved their joint highest finish of fifth position in the 1920-1921 season. The core of that team was kept in place for the following campaign, with several youth players, including Schindler, promoted to the senior squad, giving greater depth and ensuring that the success continued. Age 18, Schindler was handed his senior debut by coach Rudolf Klicker on match day 6 in a clash between Hertha and Wacker. Although curiously, the game was abandoned after just 30 minutes due to a storm, with the score at 1-1. It was not completed until almost four months later. Schindler's first senior goal came in the second match of the 1922-23 season, when he drew his side level at 2-2 against Admira. But strangely enough, there was no mention of the goal in the contemporary press, as the newspapers were all on strike at the time. Schindler continued his promising form, scoring further goals against Rapid and Simmering at SC. But in May of 1923, disaster struck. On a visit to a swimming pool with some friends, Schindler slipped and badly injured his knee. He knew it was serious, as he was unable to stand unaided. A comprehensive medical examination revealed he had damaged the meniscus in his right knee, plunging his sporting career into doubt. In those days, medicine wasn't as advanced and there was no guarantee that an elite athlete would overcome damage to such an important joint. Football in Austria at that stage was not yet professional and so the players received no official wages but were instead given vouchers to buy food or visit restaurants as alternative forms of remuneration. Schindler's injury meant he had to forego such benefits and, having no other sources of income, the young forward faced an uncertain future. To support himself, Schindler found work as a metal worker in a car factory but fortunately, he eventually fought his way back to fitness and finally made his comeback for Hertha nine months later in a 2-0 defeat to Wiener Sportclub in February 24. However, his return to action was not enough to prevent Hertha's 12-year stay in the top flight from coming to an end, and they were relegated to the second tier at the end of the 23-24 season, following a 2-2 stalemate with First Vienna. Schindler never played for the club again. Chapter 3. 
rise to fame. Several years of mismanagement off the pitch had left Hertha Vienna in a precarious financial situation. The most damaging action came when the club's president, Ratzel, made the incomprehensible decision to expand the stadium beyond its 15,000 capacity, even though the attendances had only averaged around 7,000 in the three years between 1920 and 23. As a result, the club was plunged into a crisis from which it never truly recovered. By the time Hertha Vienna were relegated in July 1924, their debts amounted to more than one billion kroner, and it became clear that the only way to extricate themselves from their perilous financial situation would be to sell the club's most prized players. Franz Solil joined Rapid, and Johan and Franz Listerpad moved to rivals Rudolf Sugel, while Schindler and two of his other teammates, Karl Schneider and Max Reiterer, joined Wiener Amateur Sportverein, who would later be renamed as Austria Vienna. For the sake of simplicity, we'll refer to the club by its current name for the remainder of our story. If the legend is to be believed, the Violets were predominantly interested in Schneider and Reiterer, but both refused to join the club without their childhood friend. The following conversation is said to have taken place between the two players and an Austria Vienna club official. OK, we'd be happy to join Austria Vienna, but we have a friend and we don't want to leave him behind. We want to bring him with us. Well, who's your friend? It's Schindler. The Austria Vienna coach at the time was Gustav Lanzer, who had spent part of his playing career at Hertha. Although he had departed a year before Schindler's arrival, he knew the youngster well and the request was agreed despite concerns from club officials about the physical condition of the player. The trio was subsequently transferred for the modest sum of 3,000 shillings to the Violets, who had just won their first league title in their history. Schindler's first season with the club, the 1924-25 campaign, was a success. He made his debut on the 5th of October 1924 against First Vienna and two weeks later scored his first goal for the club in a victory over eventual champions Hakua Vienna. The Violets eventually finished the season in second place, but Schindler's knee took another bashing in their final game of the season against VRC and he missed the cup final, which Austria Vienna won thanks to a 3-1 victory over First Vienna. The club's vice president, Emmanuel Schwarz, sent him for an operation that was followed by a seven-month spell on the sidelines. Schindler, whose slight and slender frame earned him the nickname The Paper Man, missed the first few months of the 1925-26 campaign, but was back in time to steer his team to the title and played a pivotal role as they lifted the Vienna Cup for an unprecedented third season in a row, following a 4-3 victory over First Vienna in the final. But perhaps his best display came in the semi-final, when an inspired Schindler helped his team come from behind to beat Simmeringer SC 4-2. The newspapers the following day were full of praise, lauding Schindler's brilliant technique and his link-up play with the other strikers. But obviously, newspaper reports can only tell you so much about a player, and video footage of football in the 1930s is, of course, scarce. We wanted to find out exactly what kind of player Matthias Schindler was and which modern-day stars his style most closely resembled. So we spoke to Camillo Franca, a sports journalist based in Buenos Aires who spent many years researching and writing the most comprehensive biography of Schindler to date. He spent a lot of time poring over archive footage during the course of his research, and here is what he had to say about Schindler as a player. As a footballer, he stood out because of his technique. He was very skillful. Physically, he was thin and tall, so he wasn't built for physical clashes but rather for using tactics, technique and dribbling to win individual one-on-ones. Of course, he had a capacity to score a lot of goals. Over the course of my extensive research, I managed to put together all of his career statistics. They show that he is the second top goalscorer in the history of Austria Vienna, a club which has been in existence for more than 100 years. Although Schindler was a centre forward, he tended to drop deep, to try to be the playmaker, a false nine in today's terms. Perhaps Schindler was the first great false nine. There were more well-known ones like the Hungarian, Hidekuti, or even these days, at certain times, Messi. So in that sense, Schindler was a pioneer in the tactical evolution of football in the Viennese school of that era. When it comes to comparing him to a current footballer, well, based on my research, I think he was the Messi of the 30s. I think he was a great player. I think there are some similarities with Zidane in terms of technique and style of play, control and skill. 
Of course, he was more of a goal scorer than Zidane, but he was a great playmaker in every sense of the word. Chapter 4 Kings of the Continent In the interview with Camillo Franca, we spoke about a number of topics, such as how he came to be interested in a footballer who played on the other side of the world a century earlier, and what challenges he faced when researching his book. But one of the things we were most keen to find out about were the sporting highlights of Matthias Schindler's career. We asked Mr Franca which achievements had stood out most to him during the course of his research, and he was quick to pick out two successes at club level. If I had to pick out the highlights of his football career, I would have to mention the two Mitropa Cups he won with Austria Vienna in 1933 and 1936. They are still the most important honours that the club has won in its history, and Schindler was prominent in those wins. Now, if you sat there scratching your heads wondering what the Mitropa Cup was, or if you vaguely heard of the competition but can't quite recall where from, well, you're not alone. We had to do our research too. To put it simply, the Mitropa Cup was the first ever major international club competition and a forerunner to the European Cup. The first edition started in August 1927 and comprised a total of eight teams, two from Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia and Italy. They played a knockout format, which started with quarterfinals and then progressed to semi-finals and a final. Each round had two legs and a third match was played in the event of a tie. The countries involved could either send their respective league winners and runners-up, or league and cup winners to take part. Austria, for instance, chose to send its league and cup winners, but in the early years of the competition it was the likes of Rapid Vienna, Admira Vienna and Wiener Arce who repeatedly represented the country on the international stage. In fact, it was not until 1933 that Austria Vienna and Schindler first graced the European stage, having won the Austrian Cup earlier that year. They were joined in the tournament by First Vienna, who had qualified by winning the league title, Uzpest FC and MTK Budapest from Hungary, Slavia Prague and Sparta Prague from Czechoslovakia, and Juventus and Ambrosiana from Italy. Ambrosiana was the name modern-day Inter Milan went by back then. First up for Schindler and his side was a foreboding tie against Czech champions Slavia Prague. They were one of the great teams of the era, boasting goalscorer František Svoboda and shot-stopper František Planicka, who has since been named the ninth best goalkeeper of all time by the International Federation of Football History and Statistics. In fact, eight of the 11 players in that Slavia side were in the Czech team that finished runners-up in the 1934 World Cup a year later. Slavia won the first leg 3-1, but Austria pulled off a surprise in the return fixture with a 3-0 victory rounded off by a third goal from Schindler. The reward was a semi-final meeting with Juventus, who had just won their third Serie A title in a row. They had an equally good goalkeeper, Captain Giampiero Combi, a fearsome centre-forward in Giovanni Ferreri and the tough-tackling centre-back Luis Monti, who remains the only player to this day to have played in two World Cup finals for two different countries. It was Monti, a naturalised Italian born in Argentina, who was tasked with man-marking Schindler. The Austrian opened the scoring in the early stages in front of 50,000 fans at the Prater Stadion, but subsequently suffered at the hands of Monti, whose approach was so aggressive that he was actually dismissed in the 85th minute. Austria Vienna went on to record an impressive 3 0 win thanks to goals from Viertel and Spechtel. The second leg in Turin ended in a 1 1 draw, and the Violets were through to the final, where they faced the other Italian team, Ambrosiana Inter. Initially, however, the two teams could not find a date to play the final. Unlike the modern day, when fixtures are determined months in advance by an intercontinental organisation like UEFA, it was up to club representatives to liaise and schedule matches in those days. It may seem unthinkable nowadays, but the scheduling obstacle was the fact that Giuseppe Miazza, the idol of that Ambrosiana side, didn't want to have to bring forward the end of his summer holidays. Eventually, the two clubs agreed on a date, and Austria boarded a train to Milan on the 1st of September, two days ahead of the first leg. But that game did not go according to plan, with two quick-fire goals before half-time, leaving Austria with a mountain to climb. But in the second half, the Italians sat back and Spechtel managed to halve the deficit at 2-1. The second leg, which was set to take place five days later, looked evenly poised. In the end, it was to be one of the great nights of Schindler's career. It was a spectacular scene at the Prater Stadion, where 58,000 spectators reportedly made it for the biggest attendance at a football match outside of Great Britain since the end of World War I. 
the game got off to a slow start, but the home fans finally had reason to cheer on the 44-minute mark when Schindler converted a spot kick awarded for a foul on Viertel. Once the second period had restarted, Ambrosiana equalised when Miazza capitalised on a mistake from Nausch and teed up Fiorne. But the Czech referee disallowed the goal for offside and the visitors lost their heads, with both Alemandi and Di Maria receiving their marching orders. Schindler looked to have put the tie to bed a short while later when he met a high pass from Molzer with a beautiful volley that doubled the host's lead. At that stage, with a two-goal lead and two players more on the pitch, it looked like Austria had it sewn up. But to the disbelief of the crowd, the legendary Miazza pulled a goal back for Ambrosiana with seven minutes to go. The visitors unsurprisingly sat back and defended, hoping to keep the score at 2-1 on the night and 3-3 on aggregate and force a decider given that they only had nine players on the pitch. However, with only 120 seconds to go, Molzer broke through on goal and hit a square ball that initially seemed to be heading towards no one. But Schindler, as he so often did, manoeuvred himself into the right place at the right time to make it 3-1 and seal the title. The reaction was remarkable. Up in the stands, spectators were fainting with joy. On the pitch, the Ambrosiana captain Miazza burst into tears. But the real hero was Schindler, whose hat-trick that evening forever cemented his place as an Austria-Vienna legend. To prove it wasn't a one-off, Austria-Vienna and Schindler went on to win the competition again three years later. This time, in 1936, it was an expanded tournament in which four Swiss clubs took part, and so there was a qualifying round in order to book a place in the round of 16. Austria beat Grasshoppers from Zurich 4-2 in that round before defeating Italian champions Bologna, Czech runners-up Slavia Prague and Hungarian runners-up Ujpest en route to a final against Sparta Prague. The Violets recorded a 1-0 aggregate victory to claim their second Mitropa Cup title. But nothing would match the drama and Schindler's heroics from three years earlier. To this day, it remains one of the most famous victories by an Austrian team in European competition. That brings us to the end of part one of our historical special episode. We hope you're enjoying the story so far. Tune into the other Bundesliga again soon to hear part two of the Matthias Schindler story. In the meantime, you can follow us on Twitter at OtherBundesliga for a more modern take on all the goings-on in the Austrian game. Mm-hmm.